going to be reading part three of the of the Star of Bethlehem sermon preached by John Taylor, the Reverend. This is part three of that. Now um, I've noticed these are kind of long, and I think they are meant to be like a regular church sermon, but uh, I read part one, two, and an introduction, and evidently the Robert Taylor was a reverend, and he was, uh, he was dismissed from his position because he believed that uh, the, the scriptures were interpreted incorrectly, and he's basically saying how he thinks the interpreter it should be interpreted in a series of sermons. So I'm going to go ahead and continue the sermons until we finish the book. So here we go. Part 3, The Star of Bethlehem, A Sermon. And a bonnie pulpit it is. So, they think that he said this at the rotunda at Blackfriars Friars Road, November 21st. 1830. It happens to be November 24th when I'm doing this. If you want to analyze the numbers or do a little numerology with that, go right ahead be my guest. You can put it in the comments box below. So here we go. Where is he that is born King of the Jews, that we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him? Matthew 2.2. Upon returning this third time to the stable of Bethlehem, I am obliged to suppose my hearers already in possession of what I am sure those who have been hearers of the two preceding discourses on this subject have felt to be those rich treasures of philological, scientific, and historical learning, which it is the great aim of these lectures to lay before the public mind. <gasps> Oh, excuse me, I sneezed. I'm sorry. I must now take them up at the spot where on Sunday evening last I left them. That is, at the stable door in Bethlehem of Judea, where I had the honor of introducing them to an acquaintance with Herod the king, and of conciliating their forgiveness and reconciliation with Herod in majesty, for having slain, his having slain all the children from two years old and under that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof, which gave occasion to Rachel, notwithstanding her having been dead 1,732 years before it happened, to weep for her children, when she would not be comforted because they were not. Here, then, we resume the thread of the delightful studies the anatomy of language has enabled, to, upon, enabled us to lay upon the primitive ideas involved in those mystical words. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, we have found historically that these very words, that is the meaning of them, in the whole identity of everything they refer to, or by any possibility could refer to, are a direct plagiarism from the Sanskrit text of the Bhagavat Padur Purana, that is in English the Book of God, of the Hindus ascribed and universally admitted to have been written by the divine inspiration of the Brahmanical priest Vyasa, who lived and flourished in India at the lowest calculation 1,500 years before our unluckily imagined epoch of the birth of Christ. We have found astronomically that in this most minute, even the most wonderfully minute applications as accurately as the wax fills up every mark and the line engraven in, in the seal, the whole story betrays the character of an astronomical 
enigma or parable and is a picture in words of the annual phenomena of the solar system. Three, we have found philologically that upon tracing back the words themselves to their radicals or first types, they're literally itself astronomical, whereby we have the same sort of perfectly mathematical demonstration as when we work out an algebraic problem geometrically and when we work back the geometrical result algebraically. Thus, history, philology, and science com <clears throat> combine in one great trinity of demonstration to prove the falsehood of the gospel. The radicals of our text read philologically, that is, according to the first types, throw up the perfect and complete astronomy. Now when the sun entered into the zodiacal sign of the month of August in the ephemeris of Hercules, the regulator, then follows in our English version, behold, there came wise men from the east. But here again is an egregious and most deceitfully intended false translation in our English testaments. <clears throat> excuse me, in order to produce a respect for these imaginary baby worshippers, to which they were by no means entitled. They are not called wise men, but magi, that is, magicians or conjurers, notwithstanding strong reason, which some may think they have to suspect. They were no conjurers. The fathers of the church generally speak of these wise men of the East as being three kings in order to make out the accomplishment of that prophecy. The king of the Th Tharsis of the Isles shall give presents. The king of Arabia and Saba shall bring gifts. Se 72nd Psalm. But bring, I pray, as you would in all other sciences, bring down the rich stores of the knowledge already acquired to aid ye in further demonstrations to which we now tend, the identity of Jesus Christ with the Son, the accordance of all the circumstances of this mythological history from his imaginary conception by the Virgin Mary to his death, resurrection, ascension, and final coming again as he does every year, to judge both the quick and the dead. That is to divide an equable portion of his light and heat to both hemispheres. That is to us and to our antipodes in being night with them when it is day with us and vice versa. All this having been so clearly proved the presence of these wise men of the East, the first worshippers of the infant. Yes, these magi, with their gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, which were from the eternal ages, the first tributary offerings consecrated to the sun, is, as it were, the clencher to the nail driven in the shirt in a sure place, a demonstration never to be withdrawn, that the whole story of the gospel from first to last was derived from these magi, and never was, nor is, any other than the ancient occult or hidden. Um, so this had an asterisk on it next to the Psalms, and I'm going to go ahead and read this psalm. So beautifully versified, in the Ecologue of the Messiah. See barbarous nations at thy gates attend, walk in thy light and in thy temple bend. See thy bright altars thronged with prostrate kings and heaped with products of Sabian, Sabian springs. For thee a doom spicy forest blow and seeds of gold in Orifers mountains glow. 
So um, the occult science, which the Apostle Paul calls theo theosophy, or wisdom of God in a mi mystery, but which in plain English is the black art or magic. We speak wisdom, he says he, to them that are perfect, i.e. to the initiated, to them that are up to the trick on it, n yet not the wisdom of this world, not a science or anything historical, or that ever really happened, but the theosophy or astronomy in disguise event, even the hidden wisdom. Again, I do not read Greek. If anybody can read Greek, you're welcome to let me know what that says. That is the magic, the black art, in honor of which its priests and preachers to this day wear black gowns and black dresses, the very library itself of their divine master, the Black Prince. As you may see by dissecting the word gospel into its radicals, that is, God's spell, the spell charm, or magical incantation, by the repetition of certain words, of which will, with your eyes shut, and putting your body in the shape of a constellation Orion, one knee up, the other thrust from you, and the hands clasped together thus, it was believed that the power of omnipotence would be bound to attend the conjurer. The founders of this dark science or black art are universally admitted to have been these magi, and our Christian antiquaries are proud to quote the celebrated passage from the Zend Avesta of the Persian Zoroaster, which is found so strikingly coincident with this pretended visit of the Eastern Magi to the stable of Bethlehem. You, my children, said the great magician, shall be first honored by the manifestation of that divine person who is to appear in the world. A star shall go before you to conduct you to the place of his nativity, and when you have found him, present to him, your, present to him your ob, oblations and sacrifices, for he is indeed your Lord and everlasting King. Um, and this says Birder's Oriental Customs. The Apostolic Father Ignatius Bishop of Antioch, in the fourth of his epistle to the Ephesians, after admitting the virginity of Mary and he who was born of her, as also the story of his death, were the subjects of this black art or hidden science, and done in secret by God, asks and answers for himself. How then was our Savior manifested to the world? A star shone in heaven beyond all other stars, and its light was inexpressible. And its novelty struck terror in men's minds. All the rest of the stars, together with the sun and moon, were the chorus of the star. But this sent out its light exceedingly above them all. While in the gospel quoted by St. Paul under the title of the Gospel of the Circumcision, we are instructed not merely that the star came and stood over the stable where the young child was, which was certainly very polite of him, but that he actually walked into the stable, and behold, it was all filled with lights, greater than the lights of lamps and candles, and greater than the light of the sun itself. So the Holy Church throughout the world has never ceased to celebrate this affair of the star as an event as real and as historical, and indeed it is just as much so as any other portion of this whole bag of moonshine. The sixth day of January, commonly called the twelfth day, being twelve days from Christmas, famous for eating cakes, and as famous for its proof of what cakes have been made of 
Christians is entitled in our Christian calendars, The Epiphany of Our Lord. It is the most holy festival of our most holy church, set apart in express commemoration of this appearance of the star. So the magicians, as it is acknowledged in the collect or incantation for the epiphany or manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles, O God, who by the leadings of a star didst manifest thy only begotten Son, to the Gentiles mercifully grant that we which know thee now by faith may after this life have the fruition of thy glorious Godhead. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This festival of the Epiphany is so much more sacred than the festival of Christmas, merely that the four successive Um, Galatians 2 7 the gospel of the circumcision being evidently another name for the gospel of infancy in which the following passage will be found chapter 1 verse 10 okay well you can look at that if you want page 38 I don't have the Bible with me Sundays will follow it are entitled to do you want to you think we should look that up? All right, let's go look that up. Galatians 2, 7. Let's go look that up. Galatians 2, 7, okay. Instead, they saw that God had given me the responsibility of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as he had given Peter the responsibility of preaching to the Jews. Oh, here it is. The Council at Jerusalem. But as for the highly esteemed, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. Those leaders add, added nothing to me. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted to preach the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. <clears throat> for the one who was at work in Peter's apostleship to the circumcised was also at work in the apostleship to the Gentiles. Okay, I don't know. It doesn't really. All right. Well, let's go back here. Sundays which follow it are entitled first, second, third, fourth Sundays after Epiphany. Well, throughout Egypt in the East, whence all our Christianity was derived, the day of the Epiphany was considered as the same as that of the birth of Christ and was uniformly observed the 6th of January. The Epiphany now, the Epiphany, should not a sensible man insist on knowing what is the meaning of Epiphany? I suspect again, thereby hangs a tale. Could you have clearer evidence of the fact that Christianity is kept up solely by artifice of keeping people in ignorance than the fact which your own experience attests in the other persons and perhaps in yourself that not one in a million of those who keep up the festival of the Epiphany who say the collect for epiphany, who stare at the twelfth cakes in the pastry cook's windows on the epiphany and play conundrums and draw lots for the king and queen on each returning festival of the epiphany, 
ever dreams that this game at riddles and drawing for characters is a continuance of the never interrupted religion of the ancient paganism in honor of the black art of magic of these celebrated magicians. And the Fane's compounded word epiphany that is concerning Fanus is the name perfectly synonymous with the name Christ literally signifying all that the names Jesus and Christ ever signified, that is the Son. Venus and Fane's once epiphany or manifestation was a distinguishing epithet of the god Apollo, that is the sun, or the light of the sun is being the property of the light of the sun to make manifest upon the property we find the Apostle Paul playing off his puns and riddles that whatever doth make manifest in is light. And John again, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And that was the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And for this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might dissolve the works of the devil, i.e. the Son, five Ephesians, becomes Fanes, the shiny bright one. He may dissolve of the frosts of winter. Let's go look up five Ephesians. I might have spelled it wrong, I did it. Okay. Here it is. Five Ephesians. Well, this is pretty darn long. Children of light. For you once, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists of all in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Test and prove what pleases the Lord. Have no fellowship with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by light becomes visible. For everything that is illuminated becomes a light itself. So it is said, Rise up from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Huh. Well, it's a little longer than I thought. I think I'm just going to go back to here. Okay. Becomes Fanes, the shiny bright one. He may dissolve the frost of winter. He appears in Fanes, the ram of March, to counteract the evils that follow the tr in the train of the diabolical genius of November. But the god Eros, which signifies love and was the Greek name for Cupid, received the name Fanes because he was first manifested, and hence that ridiculous conundrum, which our Methodists are so fond of quoting, but of the meaning of which they are so exquisitely ignorant, God is love. Yes, he is, and is as much as a, as a horse, and no more know they of the meaning of God's being love. The Roman poets, deriving their theology from the Greeks, with a little inquiry as Christians have mistaken Phaon, who's the name, who is the same as Phanes, for the son of the sun, whereas he was unquestionably the sun himself, as the son of, as the god of light, represented as the firstborn of heaven, as in that verse of the eight ancient orifice. Firstborn Phaeton, son of the far shining morning, an attribute distinctively retained to the epiphany of Christianity in the incantation of the epiphany. Oh God, who did us manifest 
confessed thy only begotten son of the Gentiles, as he is... Well, let's look at these footnotes. God is love, the fragment of the Babylonian Shnathon, translating from the Phoenician into Greek by Philus Biblus, Preserve the passage from theology of the ancient Phoenicians. All right, I got an idea. Let's look this up and see if it's fiction or not. Let's see if this guy is spot on or what. He, he's supposedly... Um, let's do a little fact check checking here. I never heard of this. Corey's Ancient Fragments? Okay, here. Corey's Ancient Fragments is a compendium of fragments from ancient writers collected and published by the antiquarian Isaac Preston Corey. Uh, fragments, Phoenician, Babylonian, Egyptian. Okay, so the Phoenician, also known as the Sashnian, ugh, I can't pronounce that. Phoenician author of at least three works, originally written in the Phoenician language, the only surviving and partial paraphrase summary of a Greek translation of Philo Bibos, according to Christian Bishop. All right, okay, so this guy is a real scholar, okay. A real reverend scholar, okay. Translated from the Phoenician into Greek by Philo Biblos, um, the ancient, when the spirit be became enamored of his own perfections, he begat Cupid, for Cupid was the beginning of the creation of all things. Thus, cu little Cupid and little Jesus, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, and who is expressly entitled to the beginning of the creation of God, are demonstrated to be one and the self-same figment of imagination. And the Christian who denies the real existence of the holy child Cupid, while he believes in the existence of the holy child Jesus, only shows that he uses his reason in the one instance, but lays it aside in the other. Presley called by the aged Simon. Okay. The light to lighten the Gentiles, but nothing hinders that God, who had an only begotten Son, in whom he was well pleased, might have three or four only begotten daughters, with whom he was much better pleased, and which supplies the best apology I have ever heard of to save his moral character from the suspicions that attach to his seeming to set so little store by the unfortunate Jesus, since we may hope that though he gave his son to die for us, he would not have sacrificed one of his daughters. Bathan had three sisters, Lampedia, Bashi, uh, and Phoebe in the pagan mythology. The three Marys, Mary the wife of Cleophas, Mary the mother of James, and Mary Magdalene appear in precisely the same analogy as the sisters of Jesus in the Gospel. Of the Magi so deceitfully translated as wise men of the East, Directed by a star to a stable in which the king of the, I don't know, something, was born. All our histor historical knowledge is derived from the most ancient of all writings. Those transmitted to us from the ancient Babylonian and Chaldeans. They appear to be the first of the human race who constituted such a body as that which is now called the clergy. They were formed into societies and resided in colleges where their whole business 
consisted in the study of astronomy, which they disguised from the discovery of the vulgar under the thick veil of allegorical fictions and pretended histories precisely such as the Gospels which are come down to us are found to be. Some of their order from time to time broke loose from the collegiate discipline and rambled at large like so many mendicants and begging friars and were the inerate, inerate Methodists or missionaries of the clerical conclave. They were the professed followers or worshippers of the imaginary founder of their craft, a deified personage called the Zoroaster, who worship was styled magi or magic, and the professors of it magi or magicians. By Zoroaster was denoted both the deity and also his priest, so that while there were many real personages who bore the name Zoroaster, the original type is a mere fiction of imagination. As I trust on Sunday last, I instructed you satisfactory in the anatomy of words or the art of dissecting them and bringing them back to their radicals or first types. You will see that Zoroaster is derived from Zoroaster, that is, the two ammonium primitives. To Zor, Sir, the name of God in Hebrew, and Aster, the star in Greek, thus Zoroaster, your own ear will run the gamut down the types in our language of the word Sir applied in address to every person of the rank of a gentleman, and Easter, the East. E. Aster and Astronomy. So, in the name Magi and magically originally given to the sciences of astronomy disguised under the veil of evangelical romances or God spells, as they were called, your, your ear will trace the roots of our name magistrate, the Latin magister, the English master, one of the characteristic titles of Jesus Christ, who in the Persian language, language, as the ancient Persians were the most distinguished fire worshippers, were called, was called Mithra, that is, the master. The absolute identity of the pagan god Mithra, that is Zoroaster, the original Zoroaster, or personified genius of the sun and Jesus Christ of the gospel, is, so, is then so clear and so demonstrable that no man's nose was ever more clearly to be proved to be a part and parcel of and pertaining to his face than Christ and Mithra may be shown to be one end of the self-same personification of the sun and Christianity and magic, one and the self-same device for working on the imaginations of ignorant and silly people and rendering them the slaves, cowards, and fools that it was always most convenient for their masters that they should be. Thus the birth of the god Mithra from the days of uh, infinitely remote antiquity was represented to have taken place in a stable and was celebrated throughout the whole pagan world on none other than the 25th day of December or Christmas Day the most celebrated of all the ma ma Magin festivals where if you rectify your celestial globe to the moment of 12 o'clock at midnight between 24th and 25th of December, you will find the constellation of the stable of Bethlehem, in which Christ is said to be born the moment he achieves his first degree ascension at the lower meridian, while you shall see 
the constellation of the Virgin, who is said to bring him forth in no disparagement of her eternal virginity. At the moment come to the line of the horizon and thus said to preside over his nativity. As St. Justin commonly called Justin Martyr, one of the earliest of the Christian fathers actually draws the parallel between Christ and Mithra, that Christ was born on the same day when the sun takes his annual birth in the stable of August, that is, in the station of the celestial goat, where we have seen is actually placed the stable of August in the sixth labor of Hercules. This Capricornus the goat in pagan mythology is said to have suckled the infant Jupiter, of which enigma the undoubted solution is that the sun, who is Jupiter, first beginning to rise the 25th of December, when the days having been the shortest on the 21st, or St. Thomas Day, so that unbelieving Thomas doubted whether the sun would ever rise again, first appeared to be lengthening again. The sun, or Jupiter, or Jesus is said to be born or brought up with the goat. Thus, among nations who reckon the year to begin at the winter solstice that is in Capricornus the goat, the first sentence of the first chapter of their book of Genesis was in the first copies of the Samaritan Pentateuch. In the beginning the goat created the heavens and earth, while those who reckoned the year to begin from the vernal equinox, that is, when the sun enters the sign of Aries, the ram, which is the tribe of Gad, in the zodiacal Israel, placed Gad at the first of the tribes and accommodating their magic to their astronomy, have handed down their Hebrew text, which has become our magic. In the beginning, Gad, that is, the ram, created the heaven and earth, this creation takes place every year on the 25th of March, called Lady Day, on the day of the conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who exactly nine months afterward, on the first moment of the 25th of December, brings forth her firstborn son, her firstborn Jesus, and lays him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end as you will see there really there is really not room enough in the pavilion of the virgin when the spike of corn in one hand and the scales of september in the other she drops little jesus out of her bosom and he tumbles down into the stable the nadir or lower meridian, the precise astro astronomical position of the sun at that moment. Now, sirs, at that moment, to the accuracy of the setting of the watch, what is the state of the visible heavens in the construction of the planisphere? Why, this is it. At the lower meridian, you have the stable of Bethlehem, in which Christ is born. On the eastern point of the horizon, you have the sign of the Virgin, with the greatest star, Vindometrix, in her elbow, just peering above the horizon, which star the Magi, or wise men, express themselves. We have seen a star in the east, at the upper meridian. You have the constellation Cancer the Crab, which includes the cradle of Jupiter, literally, I Sep. That is the manger of Jael, from which mistaken words have been formed, the name of the imaginary husband of the Virgin, Joseph. While on the western horizon you have the Lamb of God, that take away the sins of the world immediately above which you will see the epiphany or manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles, which is none 
other than the beautiful constellation Orion, which you may see this very evening, those three bright stars, which constitute his belt, being the three magi Magian kings who, looking directly across the horizon, see his star in the east and are come to worship him, which they do by presenting gold, frankincense, and myrrh, the emblematic oblations in all ages consecrated to the honor of the sun. And look, ye sirs, this is history itself than which nothing that was ever deemed an indubitable record of truth among men was ever more historical. The most ancient chronicles of Alexandria attest the existence and universal prevalence of this religion in Egypt for ages, before the date of its falsely pretended origin in the era of Augustus and Tiberius, to, to this day say the writers of that ancient chronicle, Egypt has consecrated the pregnancy of a virgin and the nativity of her son, whom they annually present in a cradle to the adoration of the people. And when King Ptolemy, that is 350 years before our Christian era, demanded of the priests the significancy of this religious ceremony. They told him it was a mystery that had been taught to their forefathers by a respectable prophet. In the name of the Egyptian idol, Serapis, we have the radical Zorab is, the son, the father, the fire ratified by the high evidence of the virtuous Emperor Marcus Aurelius that the bishops of Seraphis were known and recognized under the title of bishops of Christ. We have found the same, the self-same story even in the most ridiculous minuteness of its circumstances constituting the basis of the legends of the Hindu god Krishna, existing in written documents 1,500 years before our era, and we have found the whole name itself, both Jesus and Christ, quoted by the great astronomer of Arabia, al bozir or al bam mazar as the name which, following the most ancient traditions of the Persians, the Chaldeans, the Egyptians of Hermes and of Islapus had been given to the child which in the most ancient projection of the signs of the zodiac was represented as the son of the virgin of the month of August. That child says Albamazar which was which some nations call Jesus but which in Greek is called Christus as old then as the first grouping together of the stars and the imaginary figures whereby alone their relative positions with respect to each other could be described okay so there's a big footnote there we'll go back to it in a minute of Jesus traced to its radical yes, the name of Bacchus, the sun, the numerical letters of the great solar cycle 608, and the form or sign of consent and truth in the yar of the Dutch, the we of the French, the yes of our own country, you are here to for informed. The Hinduistine Krishna, transformed into the Greek, signifies merely the good man. Jesus denoting the divine, Christ the human nature, and as existing in that great and universal personification of the solar fire, Jesus Christ. Christ, crest, as a Greek word, derives its mystical sanctity from the circumstance of its 
being universal inscription on tombstone and sep sepulchres of the dead among all nations that used the Greek language and among many used it without knowing its significancy. The simple epithet on each good man's tomb was his name and the two expressive words and uh, good fellow goodbye these two words represented sometimes by the initial letters of the two axes or St. Andrew's crosses were a most obvious hieroglyph of the two crosses of the equator by the ecliptic or at the equinoctial points that of autumn when the sun dips below and that of spring when he crosses it again from below and so is said to rise again from the dead. That's the equinox. We just got through the autumn equinox. It was the 22nd. It was two days ago here. Now, um, there's this footnote about imaginary histories of those imaginary figures that is old as when first the first race of men looked up upon the vaulty bosom of the night and said, see there, as what else could they say? <laughs> Behold, I see the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So old is the gospel of our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ, the dream of the occurrence of any one of its events or the existence of any one of its personages on earth is only one among millions of melancholy proofs of what an idiot man is capable of becoming when once he renounces his reason. Walk by faith. <laughs> Hence the name of Christ or Christians signifying nothing near more than good men or good fellows and bearing no relation to any the footnote goes on. Hence also the word Christ Christ upon their tombstone naturally associated itself with the idea of the resurrection. Hey guys, I think I'm going to stop on this page 46 and um, I'll continue uh, again more next time because uh, I'm running out of time and I uh, appreciate your attention. I will continue again as soon as I can. Thank you. Take care. Bye.